This is F Society IRC Podcast, a Mr. Robot show. I'm your moderator of this chat, Hiroja Shai. Please note that this podcast will have spoilers. In this chat, we will discuss the underlying themes, historical influences, inspirations, technology, ethical dilemmas, and other inspirational insights we have gleaned from each episode of the first season of Mr. Robot. We will be bringing on experts to share their insights and knowledge with us in each chat. We will also be reviewing each episode of the first season, as well as the second season when it premieres. We are awake, we are free, we are alive for F Society IRC Podcasts. Hello, F Society RSC chat. This is your moderator, Horoja Shaib. I'm here with a very special episode. Uh, this episode is just simply about the various theories that have been going around um, through the various boards, whether it be Reddit, Facebook, Twitter, or however you choose to social- socialize out there, about the show. I'm going to just cover uh, basically the more prominent theories that are out there, um, some small theories that need more information. And two of my own. So first off, uh, we're going to start off with some of the small theories that are that have been out there. They're more, um, you can say, visual uh, observations about the show that kind of give a hint about either something about a character or something that's about to happen to a character. So the Red Lantern theory um, is a visualization theory about concerning death. This is uh, was up on Reddit in the Mr. Uh, Robot forum. The original poster was username Aichi Smith, and he created a visual uh, album which he said every death of Mr. Robot, referring to the second season, is foreshadowed with a red Chinese paper lanterns. Uh, he, he justifies it or supports his um, theory. It seems that Ismail, uh, the main writer Sam Ismail, could be adopting the Howard Hawks death motif and also used uh, by Sor- Sor- Martin Scorsese, the famous director, um, in The Departed. Keep in mind, um, when watching the show, you can possibly foresee a future death. Uh, he'll also be updating this album with every death scene uh, from now on. So in the album, he shows that in the bar you have Gideon, who is in, who gets shot by the uh, actor, or, or I should say the crisis actor conspiracy theorist. And you can see on top in the bars in the visual here that in the bar that he is at, that there's red lanterns hanging up. Uh, he's actually kind of surrounding them. And then um, kind of a bit of a spoiler alert if you have not yet seen the most recent uh, episode. Or the, concerning the FBI, but the red lanterns are visible when the FBI members are ambushed um, in the lobby. You can see them hanging up in the lobby. And then with Kareem's death, you see red lanterns at the restaurant that he meets with Joanne Wellick, as again he's having some issues concerning, um, you can say, about what all that is happening and, and not not kind of regretting that he ever got involved with whatever little lie that he has been telling to the FBI when he meets with uh, Joanne Wellick. And of course, um, all, well, we don't know the fate of Dawn, but assuming uh, that she has somehow survived uh, the ambush there, that uh, these members are all, in essence, dead. And this is a little bit of a visual foreshadowing. So this is a small theory. I wouldn't say it's like something big or grand or conspiracy-wise, but... It's just another little thing about the, the kind of layers that the show has. The other theory is the concerning ruins. Uh, we already mentioned it once before when we talked about Leon, how he had a Chinese uh, character on uh, his hand, on his right hand, and whether or not that meant he was part of the Dark Army or not, or that's uh, coincidental. But there is a theory concerning um, Edward and Wellick. Edward being um, the real name, if you will, of Mr. Robot. So this again is coming from Reddit. It's by FK Society. And it's concerning about some writing that was seen on during Colonel Panic. And if you go back, and there's a visual when I have a link here, in Colonel Colonel Panic about the writing on uh, Mr. Robot's hat and the the ruins and what that means 
and whether or not it's an indication that perhaps Mr. Robot, uh, that that persona somehow took over Elliot and is responsible for Wellick's death. And there was a translation of what those ruins are and whether or not it has a, a deeper hidden meaning, if you will, for the overall particular char character of that of Mr. Robot, but uh, the, what the fate of Wellick is in and of itself, if he actually did indeed um, die the night of the hack. And, that, and we're going to get into that theory as well. So I'm just going to read about the meanings of the the uh, or kind of read the post here. It says, uh, let me pre pre preface the stating I saw hate theories to ask if, I, if every major character is on alternative or everything is happening in, his, in Elliot's head. I think it just gets a bit lazy and takes dimensions out of the story. But I found something that I think might be at least raise some questions if Ty Tyrell might be dead, um, God, I pray he's not, and become an, alt an alternate for Elliot. Either that or he is connected to Elliot in a much deeper way than previously thought. In the first link in my first post addressing the symbols on Mr. Robot's hat, on the second link is, a, is some new information I found with the help of a friend when I showed him the image of the hat. Here's what he had to say. Uh, he showed the, me the meaning of the hat. It means immunity to loved ones or invisibility resilience. The part I know for sure at the beginning is faint. I think roughly in a, it is a ward against uh, empathetic entities or energies from entering one's mind. A ward then, a ward of spreading one's own energy or spirit to protect and provide protection to, to family. On the front of the hat is very faint, but I believe that is a protection of madness, like the same to say to keep a mind that's impregnable, like tap, headstrong. They all are ancient ruins, and I couldn't tell you their natural form, and it feels like I was giving you the truth. Is like a, a slang, but the meaning remains the same. It would seem one wears it as a mental force field and yet to extend the force of protection. So if you think of that instance, if that is the type of writing that is on um, Mr. Robot's head. Uh, he's obviously trying to protect himself from Elliot, from conveying the knowledge of not only where the whereabouts of Tyler Wellick, the fate of Tyler Wellick, but what happened in those uh, missing three days that Elliot has no idea what what has happened, a missing time that he wants to know and he's desperate to know, but he can't get that information out of not only in his internal mind but from Mr. Robot in itself because it seems that personality is strongly um, blocking that information out. So given the fact that um, Wellick is a Nordic or Sweden, uh, the person goes on a little bit about further on to, uh, to kind of clarify his theory. Uh, you know what else is Nordic? Sweden. And what do we know is Swedish? Uh, Tyler Wellick. As it stands, I've been able to identify a couple of the symbols, definitely, where some are open to interpretation. I spent countless hours scouring the web for the clarity in defining these characters, but none of it has been concrete. Believe me, this has been exhausting work. So I'm imploring you guys for help one last time, now that we have a better understanding of what we're looking for. I'm also curious to know what you all think these romantic symbols are, could represent. And if anybody has any further translations. So I kind of give my opinion of what the what could be that is going on here. And they could have used any ruin symbols, but the reason they chose Swedish ones. And since this episode, Colonel Panic, uh, we have not once seen a clear view of the left side of Mr. Robot wearing his cap. I don't think that's a coincidence in filming either. There's something of real significance to this and something I need your guys to help to crack. So again, this might be Again, like I said, my further um, expounding on the theory is that uh, these symbols might be, these wards, if you will, might be a method or a means of blocking uh, Elliot out of Mr. Ro you know, out of Mr. Robot's head. So we had these little tiny, like, small theories, these visual theories that kind of add to the layers of the show. Now, a couple of theories that have kind of I wouldn't say been proven true, but have some kind of meat behind them is, of course, uh, Ray being the kind of the analog or, in, you know, been inspired by Silk Road, that he is a runner of a deep, dark site. Again, uh, this is coming from the latest episode, uh, episode five here, where Elliot, you know, Elliot actually goes and views what Ray's business is. And um, when we do the review of that episode, we'll, we'll talk a bit more in depth about uh, tour and those type of sites, but 
it's obvious now that he is in fact um, affiliated or is uh, you know the Dread Pirate Roberts, which was one of the aliases used during the uh, Silk Road case. And if you're unfamiliar with Silk Road, it was a deep dark website that was created around 2011. Uh, by a man uh, named Ross Ulbrich. Uh, he went by an alias named Dread Pirate Roberts. Uh, he was eventually ca- caught in 2013, put on trial uh, in 2015, was convicted in uh, this year, I believe. It was this earlier this year or, or late last year he was convicted, um, sentenced to life in prison as a, a criminal kingpin, a drug king, kingpin. Um, there's a lot of controversy about his uh, particular case and whether or not he ran the site full-time, uh, whether or not there was other players. There was also murder for hire hits. Uh, there was a lot of stuff that was associated with his site that, you know, they didn't censor certain things. Um, I mean, there's also a lot of stuff that was, you could say, not part of the site, but it's always been associated with it. I mean, there was murder for hire stuff on the site. Uh, there was a lot of weird bondage stuff. Obviously, there was drugs being sold on the site. That was one of the big selling points. And they accepted only Bitcoin for all transactions, which seems to be something that Ray is doing, considering the last IT guy was saying that the both the hot and, and cold wallets were being drained as they were being hacked and the servers were being attacked. And Elliot was here to kind of migrate that information and protect all of that. So that theory in of itself has been proven. Whether or not it turns out that Ray may be either just a vendor or the overall architect of the site is something that needs a bit more information. But that particular theory, if you will, um, has had some, and you can say, some meat to it. Now, this is a theory that's a kind of an old one, and it concerns the Dark Army. And again, there might need some a bit more information. But considering that White Rose... Um, in her civilian form, if you will, is the head of cybersecurity in China. And it seems that she is the the head of the Dark Army. That so The Dark Army might actually be an arm of the Chinese government. And if that is the case, then there's been some interesting theories, you know. Well, that was a theory, was that the Dark Army was part of China a Chinese, you know, arm of the Chinese government, um, something that is known to happen in the real-life hacking world. There's been a number of cases where certain uh, hacking groups have been affiliated or associated with uh, various governments, from either whether it be uh, Libya, Syria, Russia, or the North Koreans, or the Chinese themselves. So to have that bit of information being verified uh, is very interesting, but also has another layer of whether or not White Rose is actually working on behalf of it, of her government, or if she is using her position and control of the Dark Army to for her own end and purposes. Because we still don't know what um, the second phase is. And overall, the relationship between, given now that we know the governmental position of White Rose, uh, the relationship that she has with Philip Price, and how much of a Conclude or conclude. I can never say this word right. Conclusion. Conclude. How much they are in cahoots with one another, and how deep uh, their knowledge or their manipulation of events is going on. But to get on a little bit further about, because now that this information has been confirmed, there is a theory out there about whether or not the this the dark army, if it is actually state sponsored and in all intents and purposes it looks like that. Whether or not the 5-9 attack in and of itself was a, a direct attack of the American con- economy. So this theory, uh, which I'm going to expound here, which, which was recently posted on Reddit by DragonPup. And not all these theories are going to be coming from Reddit. Uh, we're going to get into um, a great poster and, and, and has a great dialogue uh, through at least the Twitter sphere and on the various uh, Mr. Robot podcast shows. A hello, friend. Um, but... This particular theory, uh, you know, it it goes like this. Uh, It's talking about basically the overarching plot for season two or just the show in general. So now that we know that White White Rose is a fairly high-ranking Chinese government official and that the attack on the FBI, I think we can start 
postulating that the Dark Army is not a band of hackers, but a bunch of Chinese government uh, agents. And that the F-9 hack attack was the first shot in a cyber war against America. China would never win in a military conflict with America. Their best case scenario involves Beijing being glassed. But look at the catastrophic economic damages that the 5-9 did. Who wants to invest in a completely unstable American economy when China is sitting pretty? China wants to be the world's superpower, singular. Elliot and friends were all unwitting lackeys and they were played this entire time. Darlene wasn't the social engineer. She was a social engineer herself. Our democracy has been hacked doesn't mean a rigged economy by E-Corp or the 1% or whatever. It's by the Chinese government subverting and undermining the American government. So let's kind of parse this out a little bit. Um, given that the, that the show was inspired by the, the Arab Spring, about some of the economic woes that have happened um, in this country as well, uh, right after the global collapse, the market collapse, if you will, of 2007 through 2008, which I think you could probably go sooner in 2006, there's significant uh, indicators there, you know, a little bit of ripples, but it's, it's typically considered 2007 through through 8, and then you go through a little bit through 9, and stuff like that, some of the uh, the fallout, if you will. China really aggressively pushed themselves into being part of the global market, and there was one of the things that was considered that people would turn their financial infrastructure towards China and away from America, considering um, all the shenanigans that were going on, the market manipulation, and stuff that is still reverberating and being felt today, uh, economic-wise, but also a lot of the uh, monarch market manipulation and a lot of the rigging in the markets. Uh, there was a bond stuff and some gold markets and different markets are being busted up now. A lot of people started pumping their money towards China or trying to look into China and seeing that it's possible for them to do so. But then China th began to experience their own sort of economic woes when uh, it turns out they were doing pretty much the same thing that you know the Americans were doing, if you will. And they're going going through a bit of a recession, if you will, or had gone through a bit of a recession and are climbing out of it just like everybody else is. Uh, they experience their own type of bubbles. But it's interesting to note that even still, uh, China is has a stronger, if you will, economic footing when it comes to capital growth and the ability to, to move and manufacturing and, and different and different things in mar market indicators that makes it a little bit stronger than that of the United States. For so for something like this to happen, uh, political political wise, financial wise, all all the wises, if you will, this this theory you know is pretty sound. This would be something that you would think that a a country would attempt or want to do without you know going to war with somebody without actually you know firing a shot, if you will. And I'm not quite personally sure. I think there needs to be more information, more hints or signs of this on the part of the Dark Army, but the, there's a possibility that the, it could be, this could be in essence a Chinese back hacked and that Elliot and them were kind of fooled. I, I don't think that is the case personally because I think Elliot is kind of that smart. He, I think he knows more about the Dark Army than the Dark Army realizes. He knows the nature of the Dark Army. And I think, in, in essence, even though White Rose does hold that cybersecurity position within um, the Chinese government, I don't get the sense that she is a, a yes man, if you will, to the Chinese government. I think she's kind of using her position, if you will, her status to benefit herself in some fashion or some way. And whatever that way is or that revelation uh, remains to be seen. Because there's too much of a connection with Philip Price. And yet, yeah, you know, either corp, you know, most corporations now are very global. They can easily move and transfer their assets to China and benefit from a strong, singular Chinese um, economy versus that of an American economy, if you will. They can easily manipulate themselves and be successful. So I'll continue on forward. I just I just don't know that is the case, but again, this is one of those theories that's out there. Again, uh, the Dark Army being part of the Chinese government 
has been a theory f- since season one and having it kind of confirmed a little bit with the latest episode you know allows you know for something like this particular theory to have some kind of credence so this theory from last season has to deal with Tyrell Ty- Tyrell Wellick, and it has to do with the fact of whether or not Tyrell Wellick and Elliot are the same person. Now, I am the mindset that that is not the case. Personally, I think there's enough evidence that they did leave completely t- two different lives, that Joanne Wellick would not be com- reacting the way that she is towards Elliot if she, if he were if he were her husband, even if it was a, he was acting like a certain type of personality. I personally think they're two completely different people, but given the unreliable, unreliable narrative that is um, Elliot, it kind of feeds into that. And there's visual hints, and there's um, hints in the interaction in itself that kind of feeds into the concept that Tyra Wellick is um, Elliot and another person, another personality. Especially given the the phone call and the nature of the phone call beginning in the beginning of of season two, where Finally, Mr. Robot allows uh, Elliot to to speak to Tyrell. But then again, it, it might be that Tyrell may have just become a new personality to Elliot out of guilt. But uh, Hello Friend, which is um, a prominent website for Mr. Robot and as well as a Twitter handle, and it um, has on this article by Shannon Carlin, it kind of collects the more um, 11 Mr. Robot theories that sound more prophet, prophetic than crazy. In the Tyrell Wellick one, let's see. Um, it goes into kind of a split here about the nature of Tyrell Wellick here, but here we go. One of them is that Elliot is an alternate personality of Tyrell. So it's not even that Elliot exists as a person, but it's Tyrell Wellick that is the one who's splitting. So what if Elliot isn't real? There's a theory that could blow your mind and really make you rethink how you've been watching the show. A Reddit user came up with this theory that Tyrell has multiple personalities and Elliot is one of them. The two men didn't work together to cause the hack. The same man and his alternate personality actually caused the hack. Tyrell isn't gone. He just just hidden in Elliot's persona. The phone call from Tyrell to Elliot was Tyrell just trying to get through to himself. Darlene can still be his sister. He can still be working to avenge his father's death. The only thing that can really change is that Elliot's not the star of the show and Tyrell is. Uh, The Dark Army hacker White Rose comment that Tyrell hacks people while he hacks time just became a little bit more interesting. Then Then again, there's the other one where Tyrell is related to Elliot and Darlene. You don't totally believe the previously mentioned theory, but think Tyrell and Elliot have some sort of strange connection. The theory may be right up your alley. This is not the same person, but they do come from the same bloodline. This is why Tyrell is so good at hacking and wanted to be part of taking down E Corp. He is also looking for revenge. Uh, is his dad also Elliot and Darlene? It's clear that Mr. Alderson wasn't the best dad, and it's possible he had affairs, which could lead to Tyrell and explain his account or his accent. It also could lend to the reason why Elliot could trust Tyrell with some of his bigger secrets. There's a familial bond there that there there may be bond there that maybe Elliot doesn't even remember or doesn't even know. A little soap opery, but not totally ridiculous. And of course, there is the whole theory about that Elliot, um, in fact, killed Tyrell, and that's why he has the missing blackout days. That's why Mr. Robot is, in fact. Not telling him or telling Elliot what happened because maybe Mr. Robot took control of Elliot and that the phone calls and stuff like that resulted in Tyrell Wellick once again becoming part of the theater of the mind that Elliot does to himself or he warps his delusions. I personally don't believe that Tyrell Wellick is um, either related to Elliot or is... um, an alternate personality and you know again this is coming from the first season I think you know Joanne Wellick uh, the bodyguard that Joanne Wellick interacts with and has done things and the Darlene and the jobs and all the people I think there's enough evidence that you know they're separate people 
Well, I do think that there might be some other connection. Maybe Tyler L. Wellick might have had a parent that was a part of the Watership Township plant that could have died. Maybe that's why he was so eager to um, not only rise up within E Corp, because maybe uh, his father might have taken the blame for what happened and there was a bit of a shame factor going on, or... He just wanted to rise up and just be part of the company. Uh, I think there, there's just, there's layers to Tyrell Wellick. What it comes down to is whether or not he's still alive. And given the fact that we've already gone through a theory, a visual theory about Mr. Robot putting wards on his head to protect his mind from, I guess you can say, Elliot. There's a strong possibility, and because we had that initial scene of Elliot going into the popcorn to grab Darlene's gun, that there is a possibility that he could be dead and now became part of Elliot's mind, but I don't think he was that way beforehand. Okay, now we have the, is Elliot in a prison or a mental institution theory? I think uh, the last episode kind of put a kibosh on it. I think when it comes down to it, that while Elliot is very unreliable as a narrator, I, I'm not sure if the, you know, the creators of the uh, this show in and of itself are going to go that far to allow him to warp his reality around him that much that he doesn't know if he's in a mental institution or a prison, but it's a strong possibility, um, you know, unmask or not unmask kind of you know set the stage for that the way upon which he interacted with everybody uh colonel panic kind of feed it into a bit more but I'm, I'm just not certain and with logic bomb and the way it ended there seemed to be a lot of things that had to just really fit perfectly for it to be that way so Again, I'm getting this from Hello Friend, and Hello Friend and I had an interaction when it came to about the prison theory, and while we enjoyed the theory in and of itself, um, we were kind of like, we're on, well, she was on the fence, but I was kind of on the fence about it, that Samuel Esmeral, he stated that he's not into gotcha moments, so if Elliot was in fact in a prison or a mental institution, he, he was going to show something like that, he wasn't going to do this type of a gotcha thing, so... And, you know, again, this this kind of feels kind of got you. Like, oh, another hidden thing. Like, even though most people knew that Mr. Robot last season was not um, real, that he was a figment of Elliot's imagination, I don't think anybody really saw um, it being his father completely at all. Uh, there, there were hints of it, but I don't think people saw that coming. So it was a really interesting twist, if you will. So, uh, is Elliot in a mental institution? So I'm getting this from, again, from the Shannon Carlin article, and let's see. Uh, There's a really good summary here. So, mental institution. Elliot has told, told us he's hanging out at his mom's place for now, but since he's not always the most trustworthy narrator, the theory that he's actually in a mental institution doesn't mean, seem too far-fetched at all. Uh, Vulture, which is a prominent um, publication magazine out there, has been leading the charge on this one pointing out that Elliot's mom's clinical greetings. She walks in to tell him it's time to get up in the morning, and then she tells, uh, she, what is it, she, she see you in the morning every night. That all sounds like a, the utilitarian effectless uh, interactions of someone in a charge of monitoring and corralling patients, the vulture. Elliot's mom is not his mom. She's a hospital employee. It would point to why she never seems to say anything else to Elliot. Instead, she's been watching TV. This could mean his friend Leon is also a patient, as is Hot Carla, who's described as being pyro. Vulture points out that someone's primarily identified by a dangerous mental illness could definitely be a person in War II. Uh, one Reddit, Reddit user also called attention to the similarities between the light fixture in Elliot's house and in Krista's office, who could be seeing him due to the fact that he's been committed. Krista does tell him that she agreed to see him under the condition that you were going to be more open with me. And again, with the visits that Elliot has had from both Darlene twice, um, Angela and then Gideon, 
the visiting, kind of like in a visiting room than, say, you know, a living room where you're sitting around um, on the couch or, you know, in somebody's room and having a bit of a time talking with friends or your sister. That's not exactly what Elliot was doing there. He was at, at a dining room table sitting across from each individual where there's a big significant space. So it kind of lends to that. Um, then again, Darlene herself had said that, you know, where's the she-beast, you know, or dragon lady, I should say, you know, which kind of hints to the fact that, you know, hey, maybe she was referring to her mother who she doesn't get along with, or she could be talking about the nurse that is taking care of Elliot. Um, Angela and Elliot did have a very interesting conversation when they met you know, Angela said that, you know, she was trying to reach out to Elliot, but Elliot said, you know, you, you were with me on at the train station. You, you met me in the graveyard. I was seeing an image of my father. In fact, he's right behind you. And she kind of, I don't know if that was just a reflexive move on her part or, or, or significant empathy on her part towards Elliot's plight, or she actually looked towards the direction that Elliot was kind of nodding to where Mr. Robot would be. And, you know, she said, you know, we'll just be friends. You know, I guess the romantic options are out because Elliot wanted to be, you know, his full and capable self when the next time he met Angela and not, you know, not well. And that's why he was where he was. And she understood it. She knew the problems he had. And it seems like some of it might have been actually been kind of lifetime problems, if you will. I mean, they have known each other since childhood. But... You know, it kind of lends, lends its hand to a mental institution setting. But then there's the actual prison theory in and of itself. You know, a Reddit user named Exon points out to Elliot's very strict routine. To explain this theory, the character tells, it, tells his regiment's daily schedule is of his own choosing. His mom wakes him up at the same time. He eats at the same table every day with his friend Leon. He goes to a church group. He watches basketball. Look close and you even notice that Elliot is constantly surrounded by bars is why this user wonders if Elliot is actually warping his experience in prison to fit a more comfortable, normal setting. There's the whole concept of Ray with the dog, um, Ray having an office and a place. I mean, why does Ray have an office and a place um, that Elliot is living at? It kind of doesn't make sense. If Elliot is living in the home with his mom, why does Ray have an office? Then again, he, you know, they didn't show it because, again, Ray, uh, Elliot is an unreliable narrative, but maybe Ray's office was a different location, but it, it didn't seem that was the case. The fact that, you know, uh, you know, the visiting stuff kind of hints at the fact that, you know, Elliot may be in a prison. Uh, he does have the ability to warp his... His surroundings has shown with him uh, barfing up the uh, Adderall. He thought he was getting cement poured down his throat and that when that was not the case. So there's that going on. But at the same time, I'm, I'm not sure if the prison theory holds any water anymore. And again, it also goes back to the kind of gotcha moments because when Ray basically kidnaps Elliot, that would mean that either Ray was a high enough prison guard to be able to get other prison guards to go and snatch Elliot and put him out onto a van, um, take him out of the, not only his cell, his block, go through all the other blocks to get out of the prison, out to the, you know, pathway or recway or whatever to drive away, that, you know, he was high enough to do that, shows a significant level of control. If he was a counselor at the mental institution or place, maybe it would have been much easier for him to be able to snatch Elliot. I just, I'm not sure if, if Elliot is able to can keep that delusionment, if you will, going while being almost attacked, if you will. But, you know, who knows? Maybe it is true, maybe it's not. Maybe he is, in fact, on his mother's. And we're just making too much of what's going on in his life. Now, one of the more th far out there theories, and it just comes out of from what has happened in the logic bomb, is the 
the White Rose Multiverse, her conversation that she had with Dom in her personal quarters about, you know, can you imagine what would, what a world would be like if the F9 hack didn't happen, if there was like an alternative world where that didn't happen? And, and Dom's kind of looking at her, kind of side-eyed a bit, and um, kind of ends the conversation there with, with, what would the world be like if something like that didn't happen? And I think people are making too much of it personally. I think it was just more of a a hint towards White Rose to Dom of, of a way of saying, you know, you poor child. You know, because if the, the F9 hack didn't happen, then Dom wouldn't be in China, wouldn't be talking to White Rose. And thus, White Rose wouldn't have sent the Dark Army out to, to kill Dom. Because I, I, even though people think that the reason why White Rose sent the Dark Army after the FBI is because they were trying to make the connections to the to the Dark Army, I, I personally don't think that is the case. And that's why I, when we talk about the uh, White Township um, plant conspiracy, when we talk about that, I'll, I'll go in more in depth about it. But there, there's a theory out there that, in essence... We, we are watching because of the way Elliot does things and what White Rose was trying to hint at is we are watching an alternative reality and that they're trying to, you know, goes back to the whole Back to Features, Elliot's favorite movie. It kind of goes into the whole um, possibility that we are watching or witnessing an alternative reality and that there might be, you know, time manipulation or things of that nature. So we're going to have to go back to Reddit for this one. Um, it's a little far out there, but it touches on something that has been mentioned, which is the Berenstein stuff. And I'm going to explain to you on the importance of the Berenstein stuff, because it goes into one of those internet theories out there that it's, it's interesting that that's the name of the surveillance program. So I'm just going to kind of read this theory and I'll be jumping around about a bit about it, but it comes from Reddit from the Mr. Robot forum, submitted by uh, CancerBorner69. So it starts off with, uh, the guy shooting Gideon in the bar was a nod to the, own, the show's own uh, pre-science, the shooting in the finale of last season, the real world shooting, when references to the shooting in the show where we keep hearing the use of the term crisis actor. Um, if you ever visit GLP, you're bound to see a thread on the mandolin effect and a, th and a thread on crisis actors. Uh, White Rose's session with time, I hack time. Um, here's, you know, and then he goes in about a clue that Sam has Mel giving an interview. The interview asks, you mentioned losing time and you brought up the idea of hacking time this season. The men and women who are trying to raise up and tear things down, Elliot and F Society. They are interested in hacking people, whereas White Rose and Phil, the CEO, the people in power, are much more interested in hacking time. It's an interesting idea, and I'm excited to see where you go with this. This idea that the two nature of power is being being able to beat time. And Smell laughs, you're, going to, you're coming dangerously close to some stuff, so I'm going to have to plead the fifth right now. So season one's multiple references to Back to the Future movie includes Elliot's favorite movie being Back to the Future 2, a picture in Elliot's collection of memorabilia when he's dressed as Marty and his father as Doc. There's also the whole reference of the fact that when he begins to realize that Darlene is his sister, then in essence his whole sense of reality changes and it kind of warps. And she kind of comes back into pictures and back into focus in a lot of his memories. Um, which is just a little add-on here that I want to reference. Uh, White Rose telling Dom that people believe that alternate realities are playing out as he spoke including one in which the 5-9 hack didn't happen, um, breaking the fourth wall in the process. And then there's the Operation Berenstein, or was it Berenstein? Stain, LOL. Uh, the multiverse theory, at least along the Everett wheel mold of Q and posts, infinite timelines and the time traveler can occur. This idea of traveling to a timeline with a little variance from your own is essentially like moving along your own timeline. The alternate timeline travel to, if 99.9999% you get the idea, is similar to your own. Things will still be noticeably different, such as gay marriage being legalized on Elliot's timeline occurring a year after it was on our own. They made a point to show that, that in the last episode that something that could have been edited or had it been playing in real time when they shot the episode. Not only will, not only will events occur at slightly different times, but things might have had other subtle, subtle alterations, such as spelling or word change in a commercial jingle. 
This is what we know as the Madeline Effect. With the Dread Pirate Roberts name employee on the Silk Road X site, it's safe to say this is our Silk Road on their timeline run by Ray. My theory on where this is going. The events in the show were revealed to be playing out simultaneously to our viewing, just occurring at a different timeline. White Rose is obviously determined to control the world by mastering time travel. Mr. Robot is really Elliot's father. He's a time traveler. The Easter eggs where the audience interacts with the show were revealed as a method to communicate between our timeline and Elliot's timeline, implying our real-world mandolin effect is in communication from alternate timelines. Think of it like the end of Instellar or Maya from Zero Dark Theory receiving messages from her dad, Matt McConaughey, which FOI is playing out as you read this in real time or some nearby timeline. We, the audience, are not an invisible friend. Elliot will be real to have found a way to communicate from his alternate timeline to ours. Whether Elliot will realize we are out here as an alternate timeline and just a figment of his imagination is anyone's guess. I suppose on some reality timeline he will and others he won't. F Society will spend the last few seasons trying to travel back in time to prevent the hack from ever happening. The name John Titor will utter on the show. Yes, I know it's been debunked. It will be an Easter egg. And White Rose must choose between a timeline where he does have a sister or a timeline where the shooter doesn't miss. After going to his bedroom and rubbing up against the wardrobe that we have to give up for said sister, Y Rose absolutely op- opts for blood, and that's just for fun. Three days that Elliot is missing after the 5-9 hack will become a symbolic way of suggesting that Jesus was a time traveler. White Rose is with both Nero and, and stuff like that. So this is just one of those cuckoo way, way out there, is, but a lot of people have been posting whether or not there will be some kind of alternate reality or shifting or something like that when it comes to the show, whether or not how much of this is in Elliot's head and what it, because it was unreliable narrative, it might perceive or be seen as being um, an alternate timeline when in fact it's not. It's just the delusions of a man. Um, but I do want to talk about Berenstain and the Madeline effect. Uh, the Madeline effect is a term that was utilized to indicate that there was a big populist belief where a large portion of the population believed that they heard or thought that Nelson Mandela, um, the former prime minister of South South Africa, um, the leader of the, the uh, national movement to, to bring um, rights and end um, apartheid in South Africa, had died in prison. And this was a term developed to kind of indicate how a, a lot of people believe this kind of populist belief about something, all believing the same kind of thing, the, the wrong idea. And it kind of gives the idea of the concept of an alternative reality where, you know, people believe this concept because of um, this false belief, if you will, because they live in a different reality. Reality in and of itself is being manipulated. When it can, and when in essence it's not, it's just they everyone just kind of misremembered the same thing. And given the fact that uh, communication and devices and bad information can easily travel through an almost instantaneous fashion, it's not a very big leap, if you will, that a bunch of people would uh, all believe the same false notion or false conclusion, if you will. So the Berenstain Bears um, is this kind of mandolin effect where everyone in the mass population is misremembering the very famous children's book called the Berenstain Bears, which is spelt uh, B-E-A-R-S-T-A-I-N. It's, but people seem to remember it as Stein, it typically seen like, you know, Einstein or Frankenstein or things of that nature. Or the Berenstain Bears, I'm sorry, it's spelt uh, B E R E. E N S T A I N versus what people remember as B E R E N S T E I N bears. And it kind of crops up, it's about the whole kind of like this wild alternative universe theory that has cropped up. Um, there's a lot of discrepancies about it, but basically, the premise is that there was a universe which um, the Bearsing Bears book was B E R E. E N S T E I N, and then, then the one that we are currently residing in, which is the B E 
R E N S D A I N, and they somehow collided together into one universe, and that's why one part of the population remembers it one way, and the other population, as known as what it currently is right now, is the S D A I N. Now, uh, this is you know example of the Mandelin effect, where a very large population uh, remembers uh, bits of information uh, that wrong information will um, completely. And there's, you know, all sorts of little hoaxes um, or possible hoaxes. There's one currently going around that someone found a VHS cassette that has the B-E-R-E-E-N-S-T-E-I-N -E -E uh, spelling on it, proving that there was some kind of changeover, well, if you will, when it came to, to the naming of this particular childhood book. So this kind of gives into the whole concept in, about alternative realities. And one of the theories is that, you know, again, the collapsing of universes, another revolves about a time traveler going back and their alteration to the timeline resulted in the shift, um, which means that people born in a certain period of time remember things differently. And again, it's just one of those weird things, but it is also the name of the FBI illegal operation. And maybe... This might give a hint to what that operation is, where they might be using a type of a mandolin effect, if you will, where you, through the use of propaganda, they want to get a group of people to believe something in a, in a different way than what the actual events are, or the actual events in themselves occurred a different way and want people to remember something differently. And... I don't think it was an accident that it was named that. I don't think it has anything to do with alternative realities. That's why it's named that on the show. But again, because of that name and because of what uh, White Rose said to Dom and the Back to the Future references from last season, this is why there there is this whole White Rose um, multi-universe theory going around there. So that's it for you know the known theories. Uh, we're going to get into my personal theory which is, I think is going to be kind of an overarching theory about the White Township plant, and that particular conspiracy in of itself. So what we're going to do now is move into the new thread about the White Township conspiracy. So moving over now and logging off. Thank you for joining us on this chat. You can find us on all podcast outlets such as iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, MixCloud, and any podcast catcher. You can reach us on Twitter at FSocietyIRC, our website at FSocietyIRC.xyz. You can email us at FSocietyIRC at ProtonMail.com. Our music attributes are under the Creative Commons license number three. The intro music is by Monk. The song is called The Planet Shakers, the Paragraph Remix. Our outro music is by Trevet Halbeka, and the song is Zelta Kappa, as well as Kwana, and the song is Demons. You can support the show either via the QR code in the show notes by contributing with a Bitcoin or through PayPal, and there's a link in the show notes where you can PayPal me under Hiroja Shai. If you're very into uh, cryptocurrency, you can also tip me through uh, Chainship at Hiroja or at one name at Herosia. Thank you very much for listening and look forward to hearing from you. Logging off. This has been a Herosia Shive Space Odyssey Network production.